afternoon, everyone. Um, luckily, you get a really short presentation for the last one, so I won't go for very long. Um, my name is Tristan um, from the University of Pretoria, in collaboration with Oceans Research. I'm busy in the kind of middle stages of an MSc project, and we're looking at the basically it's everything to the shocks and pressure. Um, to give you a little bit of background. Um, kind of all came together quite nicely. Um, at Oceans, the, the boats go out most days, um, and they've been doing research for many, many years here. And kind of anecdotal thing that people were noticing was that after heavy storms were happening in the bay, um, the next day there were less sharks in the bay. Um, and at the Mossel Bay Shark Lab and Aquarium that we have, there was an aquarist that was working there at the time, and he was noticing that when a, a big storm came in, that the benthic sharks, the three species of benthic sharks that we have there, um, were grouping a little more than they would normally when there was there wasn't a storm. So digging a little further, there's really, really not much been done on this topic. Um, one paper published by Michelle Hubel, she was doing a study on juvenile blacktop sharks um, in the States, and she was looking at uh, their movement patterns of juveniles through acoustic telemetry and a big tropical storm came through and all of the, the test subjects, the juvenile sharks that were attacked, left the bay before the storm made landfall and all of them came back to the reef after the storm had hit, um, after the storm had dissipated. Um, and one other thing, one other paper that was done was more of a physiological thing where um, they found that in spiny dogfish, it's vestibular hair cells. That's what picks up pressure changes um, in those sharks. Um, and another thing that they found that's interesting is that these sharks can detect pressure changes of around five millibars. So with all of that together, um, we thought, let's see what we can do in Mossel Bay to test first the idea of white sharks and then in the aquarium. So we want to see if there's a relationship uh, between the movements or the behavior of, of sharks by looking at the movements of white sharks in Mossel Bay and comparing that with, with barometric pressure and the grouping of the benthic sharks in the shark lab and aquarium. So we, we're pretty lucky we've got nice data sets here. Um, I'll get more into each one. But first we'll be looking at presence and absence data from a data set from 2001 to 2006 and comparing that with the pressure data. Um, and then we have a, I'm going to be looking at a year's worth of OSESH data, um, looking with the OTN acoustic data, and then also the spot satellite data was also from the OSESH project, um, pretty much looking at it from when it started in March, for a year after that, and then the last thing is our, our aquarium experiment. For the first one, um, the presence absence data from 2001 to 2006, these are shows you where the VR2 array was at that time. Um, it's a huge data set. There was a total up to, in the end, uh, there were 12 permanent acoustic listening stations in the bay, and 94 white sharks were tagged during that time, so it's a really nice sample size. Um, tagged with the Vemco V16 ARCO tags, um, and they were externally attached, which is a little significant, purely based on the amount of time that they stay in. Um, during that time, in Mossel Bay, the South African Weather Service didn't have, they had a manned weather station. So there was a guy who was looking at pressure readings three times a day, um, which is pretty good, but a low pressure system can come in and go in coastal towns really fast. So in between the, the, the two periods, we might not know if there was a, a very low pressure system or a storm. Um, Looking at the, the OSEARCH project, um, the arrays changed from, from that first project. Now it's the OTN data. Um, it's a much wider array, which is good because before they were looking at um, the presence absence within the bay, and now we can see how they move in and out of the bay. Um, they tagged 40 white sharks with uh, the V16 ARCO tags, and they last a lot longer than they did back in the day because they were internally attached. Hopefully we can get up to 10 years worth of data on that. And 
then in addition to that, we have a bonus of the spot satellite tags, 37 of them. Um, we'll tag with that. So not only are we looking at in the bay and movements in and out of the bay, now we can see where the sharks go when they leave the bay. So say for example, if, um, if a big low pressure system came in and the sharks did move out of the bay, Afterwards, we can see that okay, maybe it wasn't the storm system, maybe it was just a migratory pattern or something like that. Also, what's been updated um, is the South African Weather Service since it's put in an automated weather station here. So we can get whatever kind of weather data we want up to five minute intervals of pressure. The last section is our little uh, aquarium experiment. We at the, the Shark Lab and Aquarium. We've got three species of cat shark there that they usually keep on display. Um, from that, that anecdotal observation of the aquarist, um, we needed to figure out how we can look at the grouping. Uh, this was by Jacobi and Sims and one other guy. Um, they were looking at aggregation and social, social behavior in very small benthic sharks, cat sharks as well. Um, and to define a group or what's in a group, they're looking at circular zones of, of association. And they use the one body length as the radius of the circle. And if the, the circles go past the midpoints of the two sharks, then they consider it more closer than they consider it that as a group or two more individuals in a group. Um, this is what the benthic tank looks like at the shark lab and aquarium. Um, that's from the camera at the top, the way we, we kind of kind of look at this is oh, that's contrast is really bad on there, but you can usually see the shots a bit clearer. Um, we're looking at using a video camera um, because these benthic sharks usually are, are not active. Um, they spend most of their time just lying on the bottom. They only become active on feeding times. Um, but every now and then one will move around and we want to eliminate that from the group. Obviously the active shark can't be in a group. So we use the video camera to see which sharks are moving, and then we take a still from that. Um, we've got a grid that's painted there, so we can measure distances between. Um, the software we're going to use is ImageJ because it's free, uh, so that's good. Um, and using that, we can pretty accurately get distances between the sharks. Um, and the way it work, well, we already started running this experiment. Um, we do a 24-hour session once a week where we monitor every half hour we take a snapshot um, of where the sharks are and that's going to continue weekly for months and months and then we're going to compare what we see in that grouping to what we see during very low pressure systems or storm events and then we'll look at the percentage of animals in groups and see if there's an increasing grouping during low pressure systems. Um, just lastly, uh, it's, we all know it's uh, the goal with a lot of these animals is conservation and looking at behavioral responses um, is important for looking at the ecology of the animal. Um, when people look at things like uh, feeding or anthropogenic factors, um, it's also important to look at environmental factors, um, which a lot of people do in their studies, but pressure hasn't been really looked at when it comes to sharks. Um, so what's kind of cool about this, if in the results we do see that there's a significant difference in the movements of these white sharks due to the pressure, then whenever in the future anyone does any kind of movement study on plasma cranks, they, they're going to need to take pressure into consideration when they're, they're looking at the movement studies. And that's it.